they, of course, a lot of their words they got from nature, from animals yes, yes. and plants. Like the word for dive bomber was a chicken hawk. You know what a chicken hawk is? Yes. Dive down, get the chicken. See nice. that? Uh, they use words like that that were so easy to, for them to remember. Nice. And they never, they never made a mistake. I love they, it. They were real heroes. I just can't say enough about them. <laughs> no, you know, and I have Indian in my family. Like, I, you know, I have Indian in, in me as well. So Indians anyways mean, you know, it's important to me. I value that. But I could absolutely see and understand that they would use nature. They're so connected to nature. Right. That, you, know? you know? They said they were afraid of two things. One was leaving the reservation and the other one was dead bodies. Two, two things they feared, nothing else, he said. Nothing but else. They, they said when, they, when the war was over, they would have to go back and go through, the, go through the purifying ceremonies to get rid of that because they, they would not do well. If they do what they think is a sin, or something against nature, especially, or against God, yes. then that's, they have to get rid of that. Right. And they're very strict about that. And after the war, most of them didn't go back to the reservation, most of the Kotoks. One came to Nashville, and the mayor had a big celebration for him uh, when he died. And his, he came here and married a girl here and started working here and lived there all his life. And his son said that he had kept that secret inside him for so long that he would not, he wouldn't talk about it even when he could. So they didn't know. They found, his family found out a lot of this at, the, at that celebration from other people. And mm -hmm. I couldn't get there. I couldn't go at that time. I would love to have been there. I they, know. Had, they had it in the park, you know, at, at Nashville. But uh -huh. uh, some of them went to Washington, D.C. and worked in the Indian Affairs in the Navy Department. You know, they just got jobs wherever they could get them, and they didn't go back. That's amazing. They'd see the outside. See, that was, they said that World War II opened up the world for two groups. Women and the Indians. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, even despite changed that. The world, changed the whole world for them. It, it really did. And it took time anyways, even after that. Yeah. You know, it's quite a process. That's true. You know? Oh, yeah. But yeah. It, it absolutely started something, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I just feel so glad to be, have been a small part of that. You know, they say, oh, you're a real hero. I said, no, I'm not. You know, the heroes did the fighting. I just was there to back them up. <laughs> no, you're part of the process. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you mentioned this, This you have answered this, but just for their sake to be able to look at it and see it again. After your training, where were you assigned to? After my training, what? Your basic training, where were you assigned to? You were saying Baltimore. Yes, I went to Baltimore for almost a year, mm -hmm. and there uh, I was assigned in that group, you know, the 10 of us. Mm -hmm. Nobody there even knew that we were working with. You know, they didn't know what we were doing. Uh, just a few in the communications division knew, even knew about the Navajo, you know, even knew about the program. I can't believe it was such a hush hush thing. So, you, but absolutely. That's Even and then, with the then, then they sent me to, to the Navy Department in Washington, and that's where I was for the rest of the time till I got out. Then uh, Congress was so good at passing laws for us. They passed a law saying if you were married to a serviceman or woman, you could get out when they did. So my husband. Had been over there five years in the Pacific, and he was directing planes where to drop the bombs from the ground. Mm -hmm. He was ready to come home. Oh, he didn't I bet want, he was. oh, they didn't have enough ships to bring. 
oh no. He had to wait two months for a ship to come back. And he wow. said they had enough ships to bring us over here. Well, I'll tell you what they did with a lot of equipment that they had, not the real big ships, but they just drove it down and drove it in the ocean. They didn't want to bring it back. So they had to start all over. Tell about your wow. secret service. Secret service. Oh, yeah. While I was in Washington, Gary doesn't want me to forget to tell you about secret service. Okay. I had a secret, secret service pass because we would get messages for the president during the night sometimes. And we would have to go over to the White House and a Marine would come with a Jeep and pick me up and take me over there. But to get into the White House, we had to have a Secret Service pass uh, in the basement of the White House then. Now, I know, I think Bill uh, Clinton had a brewery down there or somebody did. <laughs> but then it was the map room. And on all the walls, they had maps of the battles, all the battles. Wow. And there was, there was a, a, a lieutenant on duty there 24 hours. Of course, they alternated, but and they had never, they had never had a woman career. Wow. I was wow. the first one to see that he saw. Really? When I, when I got there, I went down to the basement and I knocked on the door, got my pouch out to give him the message, and he didn't open the door. And I thought somebody's in there. I could hear him moving around. Well. Pretty soon, he, he yanked that door open, you know, just full force. He was in his boxer shorts. Now, today, that wouldn't mean a thing. But then, that was the 40s. Oh, my goodness. So, he slammed that door shut in my face. And I thought, what do I do? Do I wait here? Is he going to open it back up? When he opened that door back up, his face was as red as fire. And I gave him the message. He didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. I didn't even salute him. <laughs> yeah, I was handsome. He was a lieutenant. I didn't even salute him. And yeah. I just turned around and went out of there. When I went, went out to the Jeep, I was sort of chuckling to myself. You know, he was so embarrassed, you know, but he was completely covered. But every time I took a message over after that, he was fully dressed. <laughs> but he'd been, Good. he'd been lying on the couch, you know, sleeping. Yeah. Because he wouldn't get any messages, he thought. You didn't expect <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Your so, first meeting with you him. Know, mm. it's, I had to write my story because all these things happened to me. Yes. that I wasn't <laughs> expecting. <laughs> Have you done that? Have you written your story? And when I, I, I'm writing it, he's, Gary's helping me. Nice. I, I had it two-thirds done in a hurricane. You know my story about the hurricane. Yes. In Panama City. And it took everything I had. So that book went with it. Mm. Now, so, what, what will the title be? I don't know. Something about a bountiful life or something like that, okay. you know. I'll look for it. I'm yeah. excited for you. I think it's great that you're doing that. It's very important. When, yeah. When I left there, I wanted to keep that service pass, you know, as just a souvenir. And I said, oh, you can write invalid on it or whatever you want to do, but let me keep the pass. Just yeah. Keep yeah. For it memory. Went. Mm. They said, we can't do that. We get caught. No, I'm sorry. Oh, so I said, okay. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's all you can say. But you see, were... on my discharge, on the back of, of my discharge, they gave me a little, this is 75 years old, this card. It says on the back of here, release to inactive duty. Let me see. Honorable. <laughs> That well, hope. I mean, that was the hope, right? To have that honorable. Yes. <laughs> now, um, you were the focal chosen to learn the encryption codes and would then teach the codes to the others in your unit. How often did you have to learn new codes? That first year for the Germans, I had to write a lot. We had to write a lot. We had to 
make up new ones. I never had to have a new one with the Navajo. You know, they had, they had the code, the 211. Then they made up for 11 more. They didn't have anything in there for military terms, you know, like types of guns, ships, all that. So they had to write, <laughs> write a code for all those things, all the different kinds of ships. Mm -hmm. The submarine was a fish. <laughs> I love it. I am going to yeah. get that book and I'm going to check it out. Oh, you, it. you would enjoy it. You would yeah. enjoy it. You know, I feel that something was guiding me the whole time I was making decisions. Yeah. And I feel that God has been with me the whole, all my life. And yeah. even coming here, I this is the best place. I never saw a place like this. Everybody just is wonderful. And, you know, when you get old and, and you need a little help sometimes, it's nice to be in a place where people can help you. And, 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 and I didn't want to live with my kids. I've always had my own place. My husband's been dead for almost 20 years. So I've been taking care of myself. I know. did. I did see that the article and we talked about it a little bit on the phone, how you being able to move here, you, you and I have questions for that later. Okay. Um, I'm incorporating that, but I truly believe just as you that God has a plan in his, he put purposely puts the steps in motion and uh, everything has worked out so smoothly. Every yes. place I have gone and my whole, my marriage, my career, you know, everything has just been wonderful. Yes. And I couldn't ask for better. And I know that, well, my mother's philosophy of life was faith, family, and friends. 3F philosophy. I like it. It's it's our philosophy as well. You yeah. Know? And uh, uh, one that our pastor has told us about is God first, family and friends second. Um, your every anything you go out and do your work all the rest comes after that you know but it's that yeah. order right right um let's see on average how often did you all have to change the codes uh the first year we changed them oh they would send me one time they sent me on a troop train to miami to learn the new code it was being made up there they made them up different places you know and we had to go get them. And I had to remember those and not write them down. And if it was during the night and I got on that troop train and was all night coming from Miami back up to Washington, I would forget the code, you know, I thought, but I never did. I just kept saying it over myself. Yes. Because yes. I had to come back and teach it to the others. Navajo is an all verbal language, meaning there was never a written form. This must have made the coding messages more difficult to crack. Was this method difficult for you to learn and to be able to, to remember? That's what you just said. Yes. When, when I would see if they would send us a new word in their code, I would relate it to something that I could remember. And I still remember things that way. You know, uh, some everybody calls me Winnie because Winifred's too long. Uh, I like Winnie. Yeah, I've been that all my life. Now, how many hours did you usually work each day? All of we them. Eight hour shifts. Three of us. We we went eight to four, four to twelve, twelve to eight, mm -hmm. and uh, there was somebody on duty all the time. Uh, we different weeks we worked different shifts and the weeks that we were off if we had the whole weekend before and the weekend and the day after if that happened we went to new york city and we stayed there we could stay there four days four nights and we did that often and of course uh, airplanes military transportation was going all the time, trains, buses, and airplanes from Washington to New York. 
they, they didn't charge us anything to, to go, you know. That's awesome. Now, um, your job was very demanding and you had to be very focused. You all were seeing plans ahead of time and deciphering codes. Did this sometimes make you anxious or did, or did you find it challenging? No, you get used to it. And we didn't have time to think about too much of it. I'm surprised right. I remember so much because we had to get those messages right out, you know, yes. right away and couldn't wait around. I guess so. And, and oh, I was going to add to that. The, the usual work day was eight hours a day, but I saw in the article that you sometimes had what sometimes it was 24 hours or 12 to 24 hours because of the work you had to do, the learning part of it. Yeah, so, uh, we, we had eight hours. And when we got finished with our eight hours, we left for the next girl or next person coming on. And we switched over like, like you would, you know, working. Work. And we told them, you know, updated them on what was happening mm -hmm. and what to watch for and what we've been warned about, you know, sometimes the guys way up commanders would come and warn us about certain things they thought was going to happen. Right. Sometimes right. they didn't. Sometimes they did. Were there nights that you didn't sleep because you were afraid you would forget the code? Oh, yeah, when that. I had to go get the code. Yeah. yeah. But I was so tired by the end of my eight hours that uh, you know, we got something to eat. And of course, my my roommate was on, she was not on the same schedule I was, but she might not have to go in for eight more hours after I got off because they were, you know, they alternated us. So we would go get something to eat. And then we usually just talked and told about our friends, you know, we had phone calls and everything. Went to bed and went straight to sleep. I was so tired. I bet. I bet. I, I had no trouble turning it off. <laughs> nope. Nope. That's awesome, though. I think that's great that you were able to get the sleep you needed. Yeah. Um, during the Battle of Iwo Jima, more than 800 oh. messages were transmitted, and you were involved in sending over 400 of these messages. Without any and they error. said, the, the leaders of that battle said if it hadn't been for the, no, the code talkers, they would have been there long after that. Mm. They were there months anyway, weeks, many weeks. But it took, that is a little eight-mile island. The Japanese had gone under the island. They had rooms down there. They, oh, had, wow. they had electricity down there. They had food stocks down there. They had ammunition down there. So when our men, and I call them men, but the average age for our Marines on Iwo Jima was 19. Wow. wow. And imagine. That's young men. And when, when the, our men would, a ship would, you know, they would deboard de and go ashore then those Japanese they said would just come up out there like bees out of a hive you know and just thousands of them they had down there see that they did that because we were going to go to Tokyo that was the purpose mm. of Iwo Jima okay and they were going to see that we didn't get any farther mm. But that didn't happen. <laughs> now, um, how did it feel to be able to be a part of serving in the war in this unique way that you you were serving? Well, you know, I didn't <laughs> didn't have much time to think about it. I didn't ever think that I'd be living at ninety, telling you know the stories. I never thought that, but I I just felt so fortunate to have been chosen to help and that's the way everybody felt you know we survived otherwise we would have been speaking Chinese in California they ruined so much of our Navy that we had to start from scratch yeah yeah I know I thought about that as a young person 
first reading about that Pearl Harbor. And, and you know, and just, uh, we were criticized by a lot of people for dropping those bombs on those two towns. We wouldn't have won that battle. We had to. Yes. They had to had to something to stop them because those Japanese, I'm telling you, they're <laughs> right. No. Now, <laughs> are you able to share any other uh battles like Iwo Jima that you were able to help with? I don't know for sure. I have another book of all the battles in the Pacific. And that's how I learned where my husband was all that time. He wouldn't tell me either where oh. he was, what, what islands. Uh, they didn't want them to know. And when when they would when he would send me a letter, it would come and this sentence would be cut out. This would be cut out. I couldn't even tell what he was talking about. I could hold it up and see through all those cut out sentences. So he didn't tell me either. You know, and after the war, then I got that book. It's Bill O'Hennessy's book, Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly was on with him. How long did you serve as a code officer? Well, I went in in 1944, February of 44. And in 45, when the, let's see, I wrote these down so I don't forget. In 45, they gave me a discharge, but it was not complete. They said, you are not you're not discharged. 49. So in 49, I retired again from inactive, yeah, from inactive duty. So, you know, I was a coding officer for probably, I worked at that for five years, even when I was on inactive duty, mm -hmm. I still was working for the Navy Department. So I was there for, you know, all that time. I had said that I read that, that you stayed on and you served even afterwards. Yeah, I did. Uh, um, after you, the, you kind of mentioned a little bit of this earlier, after your days as a code officer, uh, part of that, you were assigned to Washington DC as a top secret courier. When, when did you do this? And what year was that? I did that, I was that secret carrier. You mean of the messages? Yes. In the pouch? Yes. Uh, as soon as I went to Washington, then that's when I got the pouch and the secret messages and started to being a courier as well as a coding officer. What did your job as a courier in Washington DC what was required of you? To take from the, be, to transport from the Navy Department itself to outlying areas that they were wanting to send top secret messages. And they didn't want to do it on the phone. They didn't want to do it on the radio. They, they gave me the actual papers to put in the pouch. And... I always, nobody ever told me that everybody knew what that pouch was. You know, we were the only ones carrying that, those who were couriers. So <laughs> people had to know. And, and I always wondered, you know, what if they decide they want those and they're going to sh shoot me before I can shoot them? Right, right. You know, that, it was dangerous. It was dangerous. So I don't know. Did I, that make I, you nervous? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anytime I had anytime I had anything written down, I was nervous because you know, they I couldn't let them take it. This uh goes into the next question. Was there ever a time where you thought you might have to use your gun? <laughs> Not really. Uh, well, now, when we went down on that old packet boat down, down that, whatever that waterway is, 
Let's go on down from Washington to, to the oh. Navy Yard. But that old packet boat, it creaked and it, you know, went like this. You'd afraid you're going to fall out, roll right out of your bed. And I never knew who was on that boat. We never got to see anybody that was on that boat. They put us on there in a room of the boat in a cabin that was nobody ever came in there or knocked on the door they just they were told they were to deliver us to the navy yard the next morning mm -hmm. but it took all night to go down that it was some canal there i forget what anyway but i always wondered who was on that boat besides me mm -hmm. you know right so that, that's the only time i ever read Really felt maybe a little because everybody is so nice. <laughs> they, they're nice before they're not nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but anyway, they were. No, that's nice. I, I'm I glad that you didn't have a precarious situation. I'm glad that that, that you were okay. Do you encounter, did you ever encounter segregation? Did you see it around you? Oh, in the Navy? Yes. Yeah, but it didn't last long because yeah. the the leaders and the commanders they they were against that totally. Yeah. And Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt was he was he was an encourager, and he encouraged everybody to get along with everybody else. He said, you know, we we can't fight among ourselves. And so I never saw, I never saw a protester, never saw segregation. Mm -hmm. uh, we had in our unit, we had a black girl, you know, yeah. And she was uh, treated just the way you guys were treated. The way I was, everybody was treated the same. Nice. I, I, I saw nothing. Nice. And I liked Franklin Roosevelt as well. I liked learning about him. Oh. I, everything I read about him is uh, just phenomenal. <clears throat> You know. I'll tell you, when he died, we had to march from the Capitol building behind his cartage, took down there, with the boot, or the saddle with the boots turned backwards, you know, and everything. I'll bet, I, I know it's at least three, three or four miles. Mm -hmm. I thought I wasn't going to make it. <laughs> We had to march that when they brought his body from the Capitol building down to the White House. Wow. So you were there at that point in time. You got to see the the, Saw the whole thing. Amazing. Wonderful. Wow. And when Eisenhower came in, I was standing on the sidewalk when he walked right down the street. Wow. Because you know, he came back from the from the uh, Africa, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Wow. For you to be able right to... in the thicket. Yes. And to see all of that. I, a... I feel like I lived history. Yes, you absolutely I, I do. I feel that way. You need to make sure you include that in your book. I'm sure you yeah. there is so much that I could say that I'm afraid of. I'm not gonna be able to say everything I'd like to. Well, see, I taught for at least 10 years, I taught senior English composition. And okay. I made them, uh, I made them, we, the last six weeks of their senior year, they were all going to college. I taught college prep kids. I made them go over all the rules of grammar and we talked about different structures of sentences, you know, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And they said, we learned that in the first grade. I said, no, you, you won't remember it, though, when you get to college. Right. I tell you, the first time that group of kids came home on vacation from, from school, they came to school as a group and came, knocked on my door and said, Mrs. Riggle, we have to apologize to you. You were right. I didn't know we'd have to write that much. Right? No, so even, even they, my they children. Said, yeah, they said... Just forget what we said to you then. <laughs> I said, I, I didn't think anything about it. Right. I knew you didn't know what you were talking about. Right. <laughs> Even our children, when we homeschooled, I'd have them do 
book reports like what we used to do and then write about it the, yes. you know, a few times during the year along with their other writing samples. Yes. And all three of them, I can tell you, they all, even my son, I've got two girls and a boy and they all can write very well. Uh, I'm not saying that prideful. I'm saying that they can, it's not just little stuff put together and little sentences. Yes. They actually can all write. Right. And, and they're, when they have to do reports and everything, um, yeah. they did fine, you know, but that's what you want them to be able to do. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so, uh, but I knew when they were doing it, they didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> no, they don't. Not when they're in it. <laughs> now, um, let's see. Would, would you write home often? Well, you couldn't really say much, but did you still write home to your family? Not much. I used my iPad. <laughs> <laughs> Did I ever served on the board of the Reader's Digest. You know, they have an educational issue for the students in high schools. And really? I, I always got there. You know, I used that in, in my writing classes, too. And they asked me to serve on the board. And for almost 20 years, I served on that board. They would send me articles, you know, to read for them mm -hmm. and see if I thought they were appropriate for high school. And finally, I just got so tired of that that I, I just said, please get somebody else. At any point during the war, did you ever worry that the Allies might not win? No, I didn't. I, I guess I've always been <laughs> for our, our team. <laughs> and and I, I just think that then it was an altogether different time. <clears throat> Today, I'm not sure we'd win a war. Mm. But then, you know, every, it, it was, people were survivors. We thought of ourselves as survivors and that we helped to survive, you know. Right. Right. And you just. I think us, attitude means a lot. It really, really does. It, and I honestly even feel at this time there's purpose in this and we are absolutely needing to learn from the, where we're at now. And I have, yeah. unfortunately, I have no doubt that something big like what you went through, I have a feeling that again, something big will be what we have to go through so that that unity can come back. Come back. Yes. Yeah, it's too bad. Did you ever well, listen to, to Access Sally or Tokyo Rose? Did I what? Did you ever listen oh, to Oh, Axe Sally. No, I never did. <laughs> <laughs> I heard some of their things, but I would love to have been on the ra radio and talk to them. <laughs> that would be neat. I wonder if there's a way It'd to look good. up some of their their radio. Yeah. radio. Oh, yeah. That, that would be neat. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Where were you when the war ended in Europe? And uh well where were you when the war ended in japan what were your thoughts well when the war ended in japan i was still in the navy you know uh when it ended in europe oh what was i when it ended in europe i can't remember uh once I got to the Pacific, I forgot about the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't like, although I married a German, uh, you know, <laughs> he, he didn't come from Germany, but his ancestors did. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I like, and I didn't like the Japanese either, though. So they, they were terrible for women. They had concentration camps for women in the Pacific. Oh, man. Wow. Terrible. That's terrible. They and were they, awful. Now there are allies. I imagine for your period of time, yeah. it's hard for you guys. To well, see, they, they were so cruel <clears throat> to our men. When when my husband came back, I said he had shell shock. And he would wake. Well, he wasn't awake. He'd be dreaming in the middle of the night. And I'd get his hand fish would go and hit me in the stomach. 
and he'd say, you dirty Jap. He was still fighting that war. Aww. And I, that was terrible. And they didn't do anything for people like that. You just got over it. You just had to go through it. No, we, no, we went, that's, that's we went down in the country and stayed a month with my grandparents. And he worked with my granddad on his farm. And that's how he got over it. <laughs> that's good. Well, hard work and keep getting your mind on something else helps you to get through it. Yeah. Uh, oh, what, yeah. What were your thoughts on the use of the atomic bomb? Well, I think it was a terrible thing to have to do, but it was necessary. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, that war would have, you know, we would have gone to Japan. I don't know whether we would have been able to take Tokyo. Right. They, they were so well fortified every place. Mm. Yeah. I agree they, with you on that. Yeah. yeah. How and when did you return home? And what was the first thing you ended up doing when you got home? Well, I was still living in Washington when I when I got out to go home. And uh, he since he couldn't get home for two months, I got a job in a big department store in Washington. Never sold anything in my life, selling lingerie. And all those servicemen, and some of them knew me, you know, from before in the day, <laughs> come in and say, you have to model that. That's for my girlfriend. <laughs> I said, that's not my job description. I'm just that's selling it. That's right. <laughs> I did that till my husband, he came to Washington. When he got back, he got uh, in California and then came across, flew across to Washington. And then we went home together back to Ohio. And uh, then we didn't have a house there. We didn't have two boys. <laughs> we <laughs> went to my mother and dad's house and we stayed there. Then we went to my grandparents and stayed there for a month, then came back and built a house. And then uh, he worked for somebody else for a while. And then he went into his own business. He was a builder, contractor, and he did that till he died. How did how did your family feel when you came back and your and like any friends or people in the community? They were fine with it. Yeah. My my mother she was always my, you know, go to it, <laughs> and they were they were good with it. Uh, of course, my sister was she was in high school when I left to go to the navy. She's seven years younger. Mm. She's still living. She'll be 92 in July. How well were you able to adjust to civilian life? Oh, I I went back where I was teaching and I had seniors again. And the boys were 20 years old. And, and you know, I thought, no way. They stayed out. The, then the farmers kept their sons out in the fall first semester let him go second semester well they were all behind and when I got out of college and went to that school to teach they were the same age I was I was 20 and because I went straight through and I started school when I was five graduated from high school when I was 16 so I was behind in age wise everybody I did and, see that, and I thought that was amazing. You were a smart, smart cookie, even when you were well, young. my mother was a good teacher. See, and you yes. know why she had to quit teaching? They didn't hire married teachers in. If you got married what? when you were teaching, no. Why? In, in Ohio, I don't know. And it was still the same when I, when I was going in. Really? Yeah. We didn't tell my principal I was married till... We got married in March, and I didn't tell him till the fall when I had to tell him to get my class roles, you know, because I would have had to quit. Now, I don't know if it was that way in any other state, but in Ohio, that's what it was. Wow. So and, she and- taught me then everything she would have taught a first grader. Mm-hmm. And at five, I was, the teacher said, don't send her here. She'll cause me trouble. She talks <laughs> all the time anyway. <laughs> You, she, you says, know, she, she knows all that material. <laughs> See, then, country, I went to a country school 
we went up and recited, you know, with each grade. She had me come up and recite with the first grade. And then I knew what they did. So I went up and recited with the second grade. She said, you can't, I can't hold her back. And so at eight, I was in the third grade. Yeah. And yeah. all my school, I was out of my age group every time. 